Okay, so today I'm going to move on to a new uh, chapter, something that will build on what we have done so far. Today I'm going to be talking about investment products. Uh, investment products is the way in which investors usually access <clears throat> the investment opportunities we have described before. We saw an example at the beginning of the course on how we had an investment idea to create a snow fund and we had to create a natural fund which is a legal entity which is what allows us to attract investments into that. Then we examined the different uh, trading strategies last week, which is what uh, these investment um, approaches uh, actually do. <clears throat> Today we're back into the discussion on how these investment products are created. And the reason is that these investment products exist in different types. So I want to describe the main ones so that you understand what they are. Once we know that, we will be able to then make use of our machinery that we have developed, the quantitative machinery, to create interesting investment strategies that use these products. The main <clears throat> discussion today is going to be around the concept of the indices. These are the ones that I want to discuss today. So there is a lot of investment <clears throat> products that one can create. Today I'm going to be focusing on the indices, which is the most common. of the investment products and I want you to understand what they are and I want you to understand why they are the most common. <clears throat> In order to do that, I'm going to <clears throat> going to move to let's see a few things. Um, so these are some of the indices that exist out there. I don't know how many how well you know these ones. This one is one of the most popular. It is the 500 largest companies in the um, United Stock, uh, actually in the New York Exchange. Hmm? 500 largest companies. This one is in Hong Kong. I believe it's the uh, 60, maybe 64 largest companies in Hong Kong. Dow Jones is the largest 30 and so on and so forth. Most countries have their uh, stock index. Um, this is for, for Hong Kong, that's for the US. This other, the DAX is for Germany, the FTSE is for uh, the UK, the Nikkei is for Japan, and so on and so forth. So these are country indices. Uh, in addition to that, we also um, are going to have a sector indices. These are indices that reflect different sectors of the economy, like for example, healthcare, financials, uh, consumer staples, things like that. We're going to see them. And then we also have We also have um, indices that try to classify companies by their size. So these are large companies, these are medium companies. We also have small cap. <coughs> cap stands for capitalization. Okay, and <coughs> we're going to see some of these examples and many more. many more. So I want to spend today my time on this. I want you to understand the different indices. And in order to do that, I want to move to um, the browser. 
I want to use the internet to explain some of these things. <coughs> so here is the uh, <coughs> S&P 500 index. The S&P 500 index, <coughs> we see here, uh, this is what it, it, it did today, uh, the, so yesterday, because it uh, hasn't opened today, it's very early in the morning in New York. This index typically starts, this index starts straight at 9.30 in the morning, New York time. Uh, now it's at 7.30, so this index will start trading in two hours, and it closes at 4 p.m. Hmm? It closes at 4 p.m. This is what it did yesterday. Okay, that's the performance yesterday. That's not too important to, uh, for us. We don't care about the performance yesterday. Uh, you can look at the performance over the last five years, and you can look at the performance over the entire history since it was created. Okay, back in 1982. So that's that's the index. But what is it? Uh, this you can see it here. The S&P, S&P stands for Standard and Poor. This is the name of the company. Uh, it's a stock market index that tracks the performance of the 500 largest companies listed on the stock exchanges in the United States. It's the 500 largest companies. Mm -hmm. So because of that, it's also, it's one of the large cap indices, large cap. Okay, large capitalization, large companies. Uh, you can see some information on that here. You can see that uh, the market cap is $42 trillion. That's, uh, that's a lot of money. So it's, it's, it's bigger than most countries. Hmm? The, the value of the companies in the S&P 500 is bigger than the value of most uh, countries. And uh, these are the exchanges that use in that, okay. and there's related indices, the S&P 1500, S&P Global. These are just variations on the same idea. And the 500 is the most common one. Hmm? And there's another thing that I want to draw your attention on. It says here, weighting method. What does that mean? Um, what that means is that when we um, this index is not only a group of companies, so there's going to be some companies, there's 500 companies here, but the, five, the 500 companies are, um, are weighted to create a single number. So the, the value of the S&P 500 index is the <coughs> weighted value of the stocks in that group. So I take the 500 stocks that make up the index and I weigh them in a certain way. And this is what gives rise to the index. So when I see that the value of the index today is 4,521, this value, this value is related to um, this value is related to the value of this sum. Okay. This value is related to the value of this sum. As the constituents, the stock share go up in price, the S&P will go up in price too. When they go down in price, this will go down in price. But as an average. This average has a weighting factor. And this weighting factor, it can be obtained, it could be a constant. It could be, a, there's different possibilities for this. And one possibility would be that this is a constant value. It could be, uh, if it's constant, it's 1 over 500. Or it could be uh, weighted by capitalization. So it would be the, the bigger companies are given a, um, a bigger 
value in them. So you can take the cup size of the company by, by the total uh, size of all of the um, a, a capitalization size of all the cup. There's many ways in which this index um, it can be uh, uh, reweighted. In this particular case, it says here, it's free float capitalization weighted. So that means is that it uses some capitalization weight. The bigger companies have a bigger um, um, factor in the index. The smaller companies have a smaller factor, but it's free float. There is a committee that makes these decisions. That's how this index is calculated. The objective of this index is to get a very good description of the economy in this particular case of the United States by looking at the value of the companies, the 500 largest companies in the United States. Let me move to the Hang Seng Index. What is the Hang Seng Index? The Hang Seng Index is the is the same thing, but it's for the companies in Hong Kong. Um, I have a better description. Let me just move this around. Better description here. Okay. So these are the um, the Hang the Hang Seng Index is the index of the largest and I think it's 64 largest companies in the Hong Kong exchange. You have some of the names here. Okay, uh, there's actually more names. Um, so you may know some of the names. I only know a few, uh, but you may know more. They may be more familiar to you. Um, that, of course, I know. Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. Uh, the gas company, which I don't know, but maybe you do, or maybe you've heard of them. The pharma pharmaceutical company here. Okay, uh, uh, this one I don't know. These are the constituents. These are, uh, if I remember correctly, here we have the top 30, exactly. So these are the top 30 components, but there are 64. And they would be weighted uh, in a similar way. And these, these are just the list of companies. This, uh, all these companies, they are uh, weighted with a certain weight. And this weight could be 64. And this weight could be calculated either by a cap or just one divided by 64 or some other method. Hmm? Good, now what's interesting here, <coughs> this is the Hang Seng Index, is that the, uh, so this is the gas company, is one of the constituents in the index perhaps the largest one, but there's more. Let me get into this. I have this thing prepared here for you. What is this? These are, look at all the indices that we have here. They all have the name Hang Seng. Hang Seng, Hang Seng, Hang Seng. What's that? And then it has the Enterprise Index, the uh, 100 Index, the 25 Index. Um, look at this. Healthcare. Information technology, consumer staples. What these are, me, what these are, are indices <clears throat> that take companies in a, in a particular sector in the economy. So, if you want to understand how the, um, for example, the healthcare sector in the um, in Asia or in Hong Kong. Or, um, when the great China has is, 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 is performing, is behaving, and then this will give you a good idea of that. And this is the purpose of having this uh, indices here. Okay, uh, we can see, for example, here, this is the uh, <clears throat> Hang Seng Healthcare Index. And when I look at the uh, performance of this index, I, I see something like that. What is this telling us? What's the interpretation of this? So this could be interpreted in many different ways. Um, this is an interesting run. 
<coughs> you can see that the healthcare companies, for some reason, they went up in price around the year 2020. What would that be? Well, very likely that was uh, COVID-19. Very likely, right? Um, now, what is this? Where are they going down now? What's the reason for that? So all of these things are written in the charts of the of these indices, and this is the, the value of these indices. This is why these indices are, are, are interesting. Okay. And just like we're doing this analysis for the healthcare index, we could just as well do this uh, analysis for the information technology index, for example. Okay. And um, and this is what is called the composite industry indices. Now, let me go back to where I was before because there are other <coughs> indices that I want to mention here. Uh, there is, for example, the here, mid-cap value comprehensive index. Let's forget about the value comprehensive. Uh, let's just focus on mid-cap, 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 mid-cap. What does that mean? Well, these are the companies which are not too big, not too small, right? So if you look at the size of all the companies in the Hang Seng group and you order them from, you order them from big to small, then this, this uh, mid-cap, for example, will be somewhere here in the middle. Hmm? In the US, this has a name, it's called the Russell Index. Russell. Russell has a, a, a name. It's a name attached to the companies. They have the 2000 and the 3000 index. And this is usually the way you approach the mid-cap companies in the US. In, in Hong Kong, you have uh, the Hang Seng, uh, it does that for you. And we have some others here. It says momentum comprehensive in the what is what is this? This is something that we already saw it has to do with momentum stocks. So these are companies which are large cap and momentum. So you, you can use these indices to filter stocks of different types. And in the end it's always the same thing. All of these indices are the same thing. It's some sort of a weight times the value of the companies which are the constituents of that index. These are called the constituents. These are the constituents of that index. And these are the weights. Okay? And all indices, all indices that we'll see are created like this. And what we see here is many of them. Uh, we have, we will continue to look at some others here. Um, for example, for this one is interesting. Low volatility select index. What does that mean? We already saw the concept of volatility. See that these are the stocks that have low volatility. In other words, they use volatility as a filtering mechanism to get stocks into this index somehow okay so there is many 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 indices that um, that are created and now I want to focus on another one here this one here okay here we go what does that mean what does that mean investable index so let's say that for whatever reason, let's imagine that you're interested in the, um, in, in the particular index. Let's say you're interested in the a large cap index. Okay, where is it? Um, Here, in the energy index, you're interested in that one, and you want to invest in it. How can you invest in this index? Well, this index has some stocks in it. If you want to invest in this index, 
you would have to go find out who these companies are. This index again is a sum of different companies with different weights. So if you want to invest in this index, what do you do? You find out who these companies are, and then you invest in each one of them. But that's a lot of work. <coughs> and as, the, as these companies, they, they go up in price and they go down in price, <coughs> And if you want to keep the proportions to those, you'll have to every day buy and sell <clears throat> a small amount of units in those stocks to maintain that proportion. So this is something which is it, it's just a lot of work it, and it's very, it's, it's very difficult to do. And most people, they don't do that. When you want to invest in these indices, what's happened is that these indices exist in two ways. They exist in two ways. They exist as a con they exist as a concept which is what we meant by this this is a concept it's an idea it's a formula it's a value it's a number but then they also exist as investable and this is something that <clears throat> it may reflect this formula but it's something you can actually buy you can buy. You can invest in it. These investable indices are listed in the stock exchange. They look like stocks and when you buy them you get exposure to all of the underlying stocks which are part of that index. <clears throat> okay so we need to distinguish between the index which is the concept of the index and then the index you can actually invest in. Hmm? <clears throat> the one you can invest in, the investable indices, they are typically called ETFs. These are exchange traded, and this is fund. Fund. Fund means that it has the same fund structure as our snow, <clears throat> as our snow fund. Fund means you can buy and you can sell. It's not just a concept, it's an actual investment product. You can go to your local bank and you can put money towards this fund. You cannot put money towards a formula. A formula is just a formula. You cannot put money towards a formula. But you can put money against a fund. And this is <clears throat> what that F means. And this is how some of these funds are investable and how some are not. <clears throat> so this is something that's going to come up. In the discussion today. As we see the different indices that exist. Okay? Alright, so this is my introduction to the indices. Any questions about this? I suspect you knew this already, but <clears throat> any questions? Okay, so <clears throat> if there are no more questions, I'm gonna go back to my uh, <clears throat> description of the indices <clears throat> we have seen examples of all of these things that we have seen here okay and for us now going forward an index is going to be just like A stock. They're going to be just like a stock. A stock typically makes reference to a company. An index is not a company. A company has a legal entity, has a legal existence. A company can't go bankrupt. An index cannot go bankrupt. They don't exist as a corporate entity. <clears throat> they exist as an investment entity, not as a corporate entity. So their, 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 um, uh, their <clears throat> legal nature is very different from a company. Very different from a company. Okay? And this is what allows you to invest in them without many of the restrictions that uh, companies have. This is something that you can just buy and sell. The institution that sells the index Hang Seng, Standard & Poor's, these are companies. The, the institutions that sell the index, they have to have people 
traders that actually <clears throat> maintain, they do the trading underneath the index, right? So when you buy these indices and you put money towards them, that money is actually used by some of these traders to buy stock and sell stock. They do it, they charge some money for it, not very much, but they charge some money for it. And, <clears throat> um, and again, it's part of this a notion that an index is not just a formula. An index is an invest, typically is an investable product that you can put your money towards. Okay? All right. Um, so I'm going to now, this is the, um, this is the, this is the, uh, this is the index description in the stock market, but we have other investments which are not stocks. Yeah, you can have indices of bonds, you can have indices of uh, infrastructure products, and you can have um, indices of hedge funds. We already saw them. We, are, In fact, uh, you uh, have downloaded the indices of uh, hedge funds from the website <clears throat> that I asked you to register in. Okay, so let me now explain what they are because these indices are very different from the stock indices, and many of the uh, <coughs> of the differences have to do with the um, the underlying nature of that industry. <coughs> so when it comes to hedge fund indices. which you already downloaded, they are very different from stock indices. And the reason is that the underlying, the underlying investments are not companies, they are funds themselves. Hmm? Funds with uh, specific characteristics. So there we have two types of them, investable and non-investable indices. What does that mean? Investable indices are indices you can put dollars towards. And the non-investable are just formulas. They're formulas. They are mathematical entities They are mathematical entities which are created. In the case of stocks, in the case of stocks, the um, investable and the non-investable are very similar. Very, very similar. Very similar. In the case of stocks, they are similar. In the case of hedge funds, they are different. Very different. Okay? And it's some of the differences that we're going to have to understand. So some considerations. I'll, I'll show you. Well, actually, let me go back and show you. So you already, you were already there. You already saw them. Uh, here was the HFRX, which are the X stands for investable. These are investable indices. Okay, you can actually put your money in this. You can buy units in these uh, indices. They're right here. They're investable. Okay. However, here you could go to other indices. Um, <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> no, not these ones, uh, these ones. So these ones are not investable, okay? They are broadly constructed indices designed to capture the breadth of hedge fund performance trends. So you get these to capture the breadth of trends. This is something which has, is of a mathematical nature. All right, these are not investable. Others are, but these are not. And we're gonna see the difference uh, between those very, very soon. Okay, so let me go back to there, all right. <clears throat> so the investable are what is called, for example, are the HFRX, and the non-investable is, for example, the HFRI, all right. 
So the investable there structures an investment vehicle, typically a fund. Okay, so investors can invest. They are constructed according to published methodologies. This is very important. When you invest in an index, you have to know what the index is. The methodology has to be published. The company that sells the index cannot do whatever they want. There will be other investment products in which the portfolio manager can do whatever they want, but not the index managers. The methodologies are published, they have constraints, and the portfolio managers have to abide by them. They have to do what the methodologies, what the published methodologies say. Okay? Um, in this case, there are actually even more restrictions, um, which uh, it's here, accredited investors. You probably went through a questionnaire. When you signed up for this website, you went through a questionnaire. And the questionnaire probably asks you if you're going to invest or you're just a student or an academic or something. If you say you're going to invest and you're, they, you will have to send information to the company to prove to them that you are an accredited investor. Anybody can buy stocks. You can buy, you can go to your local bank and you can buy a, a stock. It's no problem, there's no restrictions. But if you want to invest in a hedge fund, there are restrictions. Not everybody can invest in a hedge fund. You have to be an accredited investor. The reason is that these are considered to be sophisticated investment products. And the finance regulators don't want people without financial knowledge to invest in these funds. They are risky. They may be investing in something they don't understand. Okay? Now, that's not your case. You understand these things now very well. Okay? But most people are not like that. So, that's why this is something that accredited investors are, restrict uh, are restricted. Only these ones can invest. Um, but indices is a very good way if you, for example, are not um, just like in the case of the Hang Seng, you don't have to go and buy every um, uh, stock in the, in, the, in the Hong Kong exchange. Here you can buy the index and that will give you an investment in all these hedge funds that this company has selected for you. Hmm? And of course, they depend on the vendor. There is different organizations selling different indices and uh, when you buy them, you buy different things. And these um, indices, they, they are very recent. They've only been around since 2003. You already know because you downloaded the data and you had a chance to look at it. Okay. Uh, the non-investable indices, VHFRI, they are different. They are just their publications. Okay. Uh, that gives us an idea of the trend as we saw earlier on the website. Hmm? Still people use them for benchmarking purposes. They are very useful for benchmarking purposes. And actually in this course, I would like to use them for that. So you can do calculations and we can build strategies using them. The problem is that <coughs> in this course, I want you to use a lot of data. I want you to use daily data daily data. Hmm? And the thing is that the, A, the HFRX have daily data, the HFRI do not have daily data. So in this course, we're going to be using the um, investable indices as a way to get benchmarks. Okay. So in our case, the benchmarks, we will use the investable. This is not what people do out the, in the industry, but that's how we will do it in our course. And the non-investable, they've been around for a long time. And they started like that. People wanted to have a notion of what the hedge fund industry was doing. So they used the non-investable indices as a way to get an idea of what that performance is. Hmm? Good. Um, now, I'll mention something else now. I'll mention this concept of um, Style diversification. I'm going to. I want to. I want to redo this share in a different way. There we go. So it shows uh, nicer on your screen. Uh, there is now very 
I need, I need this uh, to be displayed better. Okay. Good. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, hedge fund indices or uh, indices, they can have a lot of different constituents. Constituents. The key is now constituents. Okay. Constituents. In the case of stocks, we saw that the constituents could be of a different type. We could have a big, a large cap, mid cap, small cap. We could have the pharma. We could have the financials, the technology uh, sector. So these are the constituents. In the constituents, you can have filters. You can filter companies in a certain way. In the same way, here the uh, constituents of these indices can be created by looking at their style. The same trading styles we saw last week, they can be used to filter these hedge funds into trading style indices. Okay, so let's look at this one for example. First one, the convertible arbitrage index. <clears throat> what is that? We saw convertible arbitrage. Your assignment uh, last week, actually this week, was about convertible arbitrage. So if you take the hedge funds who do convertible arbitrage, their performance is perhaps similar to each other than if you take um, managers or investment products that use a different strategy, like for example, equities long and short. Very different, right? So when you when you create an index with uh, funds which are in the convertible arbitrage uh, style, that index has a certain performance number. It's here. When you look at um, we saw the we we saw the equity market neutral index. Remember that trade we did long A short B. When we do long A, short B trades, the, this is what the equity market neutral indices, sorry, what the equity market, market neutral hedge funds do. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are two styles that we already saw. We saw the macro trading also. See, we've seen all of these styles. So when you look at, when you put together uh, funds who trade like that, you end up with an index that describes that particular trading style. And these, uh, in the, and these indices, like the stock indices, they go up and down every day. Hmm? And that gives us an idea of what these particular trades are doing. Uh, these styles depend on market conditions in different ways. For example, if we do convertible arbitrage, this will have exposure, for example, to interest rates. If interest rates go down, their performance will be um, will go higher, typically, for a convertible arbitrage index. Mm -hmm. But for a, an equity market neutral index, you probably don't. Uh, and when, when stocks have a lot of volatility, that hurts the uh, equity market neutral index in different ways than it hurts the uh, convertible arbitrage index. So this gives us different um, indices that describe different characteristics of the markets and in particular they describe different um, characteristics of different investment styles. These are investment styles. Okay, <clears throat> So these investment styles can be um, analyzed in the following way. What I have here is the correlation matrix of these styles. This is the correlation matrix. Actually, this, uh, one of the assignments that's coming up is for you to calculate this correlation matrix on your own. I did it some time ago. Now I'm going to ask you to do this correlation matrix on your own. This, it's, an, it's an assignment that's coming. <coughs> what do we see when we look at here? Let's analyze this correlation matrix. What we see First of all, is that we have 
one in the diagonal. The number one is in the diagonal. Why is that? Because all correlation matrices have one in the diagonal. When you measure the correlation of an index against itself, you get a one. Okay, these are the diagonals. This is when you measure one index against the same index. That's one. Okay? Good. How about these numbers here? Uh, let me look at, uh, for example, I'm going to look at a very big number in the correlation matrix. Uh, one of the biggest is maybe this one. This number is, is high. It's 72%. What does this correlation of 72% mean? It means that this style that we have here um, with this one here, the convertible arbitrage, convertible arbitrage seems to behave similar to value arbitrage. Value arbitrage we didn't see very much last week. It's another style. It's, it's not very different. And the fact that it's not very different shows here. It's similar. Okay? So this tells you that this particular style is similar to convertible arbitrage. Relative value similar to convertible arbitrage. Let's now look at a very small number, for example, this one. It shows that convertible arbitrage is not very similar to macro. We saw macro uh, also um, last week, right? So macro a convertible arbitrage, they are different. So different because it's small and similar because they are Okay, so the correlation matrix is very good. It tells us which styles, which trading styles are similar and which ones are different. Okay? And as I said, this is one uh, exercise I'm going to ask you to do uh, later, coming up. You're going to have to calculate this correlation matrix on your own. Okay? Which you can do using Microsoft Excel, or you can use any other programming language, Python, anything you want. Okay, so this is when I took at the style diversification. I can see that some <coughs> sometimes I have good diversification, like here, and sometimes I don't. I remind you, I remind you that low correlation means diversification it allows you to build better investment products and I remind you that high correlation does not not decrease risk so that's how you have to understand uh, these uh, particular metrics okay Okay. What I have here is, I, li I like to do graphs like this because what this is the following. If you take all these numbers here, all these numbers, which come from the correlation matrix, and if I make a histogram, this is a histogram. It gives me a visual impact, which is very strong. It tells me the average size of the correlations, okay? So the average size of the correlations is low. This is very good. This is very interesting. There's some high correlation numbers and some very low ones, but most of them are here. This is about zero. It's close to zero, it's small, small. So this is good. This is a good histogram. This is good because it signifies diversification. You see? Diversification is because it's here. We're going to see examples where we do not have diversification. Understand that? This is a very good histogram. It signifies diversification. And we're going to use histograms. We're going to use correlation histograms to understand if we have diversification or not. I'll give you another um, let me see if I have. Hold on. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. 
see if I can remind you. I think we already saw it. Uh, just go for something else. Uh, no, I don't have it here. I think it's in a different. Um, I think it's in a different. Um, um, I think it's a different uh, uh, presentation. But if I was going to do um, the, in the 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 same, but with Hang Seng styles. Remember, there was uh, pharma. There was. Then I typically will get a correlation histogram, which is like this. Like that. What does that mean? That means there is little, little diversification. Little diversification. Because this is big. This is a big correlation area, whereas this is the small correlation area. Okay? Okay, this is coming up. <clears throat> I'm telling you these things because you're going to be doing a lot of these calculations from now on. The assignments I will give you are going to involve the use of computers more and more, and you're going to have to do these charts more and more on your own. So I want you to be aware of what it is that you see, because this information which is in these graphs is very significant. We have very significant information hiding in these graphs. Okay? Okay, let me move on and tell you some other things that happen. This is now some strange phenomena. This is very strange phenomena, okay? Let's do the correlation matrix between the HFRX and the here I didn't write it, but it's the HFRI non investable. So on this side is the non-investable, and on that side is the investable. Okay. Now it's there's there's something which I didn't um, I didn't I, I think you already know, but I don't know. Which is if you do this correlation matrix for the different styles of, for example, the Hang Seng index in the diagonal, you get one. But here we don't get one. We don't get one. We get these numbers are not one. Why? What's, what does that mean? What does it mean that in the diagonal these numbers are not one? They are smaller than one. This one is actually very small. Look at that. 50%. What does that mean? You have One of the things that I want you to do in this course is I want you to understand numbers. What do the numbers mean? So these numbers that we have here have meaning, have very important meaning. So the meaning of, of this, the fact that these things are not one, the meaning of this is that the investable, actually no, this is the non-investable. So the investable versus the non-investable are very different. That's what these numbers mean. If you do this with stocks, in the diagonal you have ones. So this is interesting because it says that the investable versus non-investable are different and the different styles are also different. The correlation histogram of this is also going to be something like this. That means that there is diversification. And I'm going to remind you, diversification is good. Is good. Okay? So this means that you can create, very likely we can create investment products with these styles of very low volatility. That's what this means. That's what this means. Okay? Now let me, I hope this is understood. I don't know, I'm giving you a lot of interpretation of numbers that I hope you're understanding. I hope. Um, 
And I'm telling you, the, the assignments that come later <clears throat> will ask you to do these things on your own. I'm giving you the solution that I did, but now you'll have to do it with updated data, see if you get something similar, okay? So I hope you understand all of that. If there's one thing you do not understand, you should raise your hand and ask me, okay? Because I'm, I'm doing, I'm explaining things that you will have to do in the assignments um, next. Now, this thing I am, I'm showing here is something which is, um, what well, I'll explain, it's another interpretation of numbers. This is how we use numbers. This is how we use calculations to understand things. What I'm doing here is this. I am, this describes the alphas and the betas of the investable versus the non-investable. Alphas and betas of the investable versus the non-investable. So we saw linear regression a few weeks ago, okay? And I think it was very clear that you already had seen it. So this was studying, you know that. Now, when we use linear regression in this particular example, we get some answers. And I want to explain what these answers mean. Again, I need you to understand this. I need you to pay attention because your assignments will actually ask you to do the same thing. Okay? So let's look at the first one, convertible arbitrage. Right here. I'm going to do the highlight there. Convertible arbitrage, the first one. What do the numbers mean? What does the 101% mean? That means that beta is about 1. That means that the investable and the non-investable are very similar. Very similar from a risk perspective. And the alpha is very small. Okay, it's very small, but it's negative. That means that the investable, that means that the investable, the investable performs X worse than I. I does not mean investable, it just means index. Okay, it's a reference. So the investable is worse than the reference. That's what it means. And the R square 81% is high. So the significance is high of the statistical analysis. High statistical significance. Is this clear? That's what this linear regression means. High statistical significance. X does worse than I. And the beta is one, so they are very similar. They are very similar, but worse. X is similar to I, but worse. That's what this means. Let me go to another one. Let me go to this one here. What do these numbers mean? Beta is now 60%. That means that they are different. Beta, beta is about 60%, okay, not, not, too, not too good. Alpha is very small, so they are about the same. And how about this? A square of 23%, what does that mean? A square of 23%, what does that mean? That means that statistically is not significant. Not significant, statistically. That means that in this particular case, the investable and the non-investable indices are very different. Very, very different. Okay, you can read this from the alpha. No, I'm sorry, you can read it from the beta. The alpha, no. From the beta and from the R squared. 
Okay, they are very different. And you can go on like that. Um, for example, how about this one here? Merger arbitrage. The investable and the non-investable. The R square is good, and the beta is good, and the alpha is less. So this is similar to the convertible arbitrage. They are similar, but the investable is worse than the non-investable. Okay, you see? This is how you can use the. We have seen a lot of mathematical tools up until now, and now we see how we get to use them. Okay, I'm giving you examples on how we can get to use them. Okay, so I hope this is clear. I'm not, um, I'm not sure. Okay, so let me now explain the uh, differences and similar, actually differences um, between the stock indices and the alternative. These are called the alternative indices. The hedge fund indices are called alternative indices. Okay, because the alternative, alternative to stocks, stocks and bonds. Alternative to stocks and bonds. So these are some of the. Um, when stocks are announced that they become part of a big index, their price goes up that day, that same day. There are several reasons for that. First, investors like it. They like their stocks to be part of an index, so they buy them. Investors like to buy stocks that go into the index. And second, the index managers have to buy the stock because if it's part of the index, they have to, they have to buy it. it. It's what the methodology asks them to do. Okay? <clears throat> However, when a certain hedge fund is part of an index, typically investors, they sell their shares in the fund. They leave the fund. Okay, why do they do that? Investors in uh, these strategies, in hedge funds, don't like that their fund is, is in an index. The reason is, <clears throat> remember in the first week, we saw that when an index, sorry, we saw that when our snow fund has a lot of money, the performance goes low, lower. The performance is lower when they have a lot of money. This is not the case for a company, but for a hedge fund, yes, because they have very limited opportunity set. So this is what is called, a, it could become a crowded trade. So investors don't want to be part of a crowded trade. So it's interesting, the reaction of investors is different if a stock goes into an index or if a hedge fund goes into an index. Okay. Um, next is the the list of stocks which are part of an index is published. We saw it, it was on the website. But if you go to the HFR and you see which hedge funds are part of the index, you will see that it's very difficult to find. You can find it, but it's difficult. Okay, so this is uh, public. And this is secret. Also different. Okay. And the reason is, uh, this, this, there's a reason for that, there's a commercial reason for that, which uh, is something which is not here, which is that um, HF indices are expensive. So what they are made of is kept secret. Okay, But these ones, stock indices are cheap. So they publish the ingredients without a problem. Okay. And then another thing that we already saw is what well, I told you is that the alphas and betas of the investable and non-investable are the beta is one and the alpha is zero. Very close to zero, very close to one. Whereas in this case, the alphas and the betas can be very far from one and very far from zero. Okay. So very different, um, very different. And I like this, this last comparison because this is a comparison that we do with linear regression. We're gonna start, as I mentioned to you, we're gonna to start to be more quantitative now. You are gonna to start to be more quantitative. You're gonna to start to do calculations and we need to understand what those calculations are. And this is one of the things that we can understand with calculations.
okay? So for example, let me see that, imagine I ask you a question. I, I hope you answer, but maybe you don't. But I'll ask you a question. Um, there is uh, something in the chat. Okay, so um, there is, imagine I ask you a question. I ask you, go to the Hang Seng Index and give me the stock which is most different from all of the other stocks there. How will you do it? This could be a question I ask in the assignment. How would you do it? I ask you to find me the stock which is the most different from all the stocks there. This is what I would do. Okay, there's different things that you can do. One possibility would be you take the correlation matrix of all your stocks in the Hang Seng Index and then you look for a small number. Will that work? Will that work? No, it will not work. Okay, some people are saying no with their head. It will not work. Okay, so Dai, I think you're, you're saying the right thing. It will not work. Okay, we're going to get lots of very small numbers and we don't know which one is which. Okay, so that will not work. What will work? What I can do is I can find the alphas and betas. I can do the regression of all of the stocks against the Hang Seng Index. And I can look for the beta which is most different from one. Many of the betas will be very similar to one. But then you look at the one which is furthest away from one. That is one way. That stock will be very different. That's one way of doing that. Hmm? That's one way of doing that. Uh, okay. As, as I mentioned, I'm gonna, we're going to start to do things like this now going forward. Okay, we have just crossed the half, we've crossed the equator of this course. We have seen a lot of things in this first uh, half, and now we're going to start to use it. And you're going to become very active in this bunch of calculations now. Okay, a lot of what I will be telling you now has to do with calculations that you can da now do. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of doing that. We're going to use the beta as a way to determine as well to determine similarities. Or, uh, or 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 not that things are very very similar. Okay, so what we'll do, you, you will do that. Okay, this is how we're going to be starting to look at this uh, type of uh, considerations. Um, okay, so um, we have seen the first in the first hour. We have seen one of the big investment um, one of the big investment. Um, styles, which is indices. Okay, let me move back. Uh, we have seen indices, and <clears throat> there's <clears throat> basically two type two types of indices that we have seen. We have seen stock indices and alternative indices. There are more. <laughs> there are bond indices. that describe bonds, these are typically very simple. Okay? And then you have others. For example, you can have infrastructure indices. You can have credit you can have credit indices and others. Okay? Now, there's many types of indices, but in, the, in this course, to be practical, I'm going to focus on stock and hedge fund indices, so we can see the, uh, the differences between, between those. Okay, let me ask you another question. I just mentioned, I just said something, I said we're going to look at the differences between those two. How can we know if they're different? How can we see that stocks and hedge funds are different? Another question I can ask you. Which mathematical tools have we seen to understand whether stock indices 
and hedge fund or alternative indices are the same, are they similar or different? How can we do it? Question. Similar or different or different. How can we do this? When there's only two, it's very easy. The correlation will do it for you. If you have more, you have to use linear regression. But when there's only two that you're comparing, the correlation is all you need. So the correlation of what? How can we do this? The correlation. <coughs> it's here. The cor I'll, 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 I'll show you. I'm going to stop this here, and I'm going to go back to sharing this. This is what you do. Let's say that if you want to know, for example, the S&P 500, is it similar to, are the stocks in the United States similar to the alternative uh, strategies? When we, when we look at that, we should look at the alternative strategies. Uh, sorry, we should, if we're trying to compare the alternative strategies to stocks, we should look at the U.S. stocks because a lot of these hedge funds, they use U.S. companies to trade. They don't use um, Asian companies. The volumes are lower, okay? So you want to compare the S&P 500 with, the, with what? You want to compare the S&P 500, this index, the S&P 500 index, with this one. With this one. Right here. Okay. So this is the um, well. This is the I. We prefer to use the X. Okay. So we'll have to, we would have to do this with the X. So I have to go to the X, not this one. I have to go to the X. That one. That one here. This one. So you, you would calculate the correlation between this one, the HFRX global, and the S&P 500. Because it's only two that we're comparing, the correlation is good enough. If it was like 60, like in the Hang Seng Index, you cannot use correlation, you have to use linear regression. Hmm? So you calculate this, this correlation. If this correlation is close to one, then they are similar. If it's close to zero, they are different. The answer is that they are different. They're actually, the correlation is low. Okay, so um, if you trade, like for example, cooperative arbitrage, market neutral, um, um, long short portfolios, then you end up with a very different risk profile than if you invest in the US stocks. So, okay, another thing that we can do. Okay, so I don't know if this was uh, clear. This is what I wanted to cover today, okay? And the assignment I will give you now, they're gonna be more computational. You're gonna have to do more calculations um, uh, like this. And I want you to understand the meaning of what you're doing. Hmm? Okay, any questions? Is this, is this clear? You can do assignments on your own now. No? Someone has questions? Yes? You wanna put the questions in the chat? I, I need you to be able to do the assignments now. So that's why I, if, you, if there are questions, please ask me now. Do you wanna take a very short break, five minutes, and then you ask questions. Will that work? Or there, there really are no questions. You understand all of this very well. I cannot tell. 
from your expressions I cannot tell. Okay, so I'm going to continue then. If there are no questions, I'll continue. Okay, um, so if there are questions next week, you start with questions and I will address them. Okay, but now I, I need you to start using, you're going to start doing the calculations yourself now. Okay, okay, so I'm going to then uh, stop this share and I'm going to share my presentation, which is. Okay, so um, once we have this understanding of the different uh, styles and the different stocks and the different investment opportunities available to us, you can invest in indices. We already saw that. You can buy the head Hang Seng Index, the S&P 500, or the HFR Global Hedge Fund Index. You can invest like that. Um, and this is the most unsophisticated type of investment you can do. It's very simple, you just buy an index. Many people do that, okay? <clears throat> but then you can do things which are more, um, you can do things which go one step beyond that. You can start to create what's called fund of funds. This is the next level up in sophistication from investing in, in, um, in an index. And <clears throat> I have a 15 minutes left, I'll, I'll try to explain something about this, but then the, the, the main methodologies for this we will explain next week. <clears throat> okay, so this is, a, this is a, a part of the chapter which I will explain next week. Um, so a fund, fund, a fund of funds is an investment, so a fund that invests in other funds. Okay, I have a picture of that, I think. I have a picture of that. Okay, let's, let's study this picture. Uh, we already saw a picture like this before. We had investors who put money into my fund and then the fund goes and buys, for example, the snow swaps, or you can buy stocks or you can buy bonds or other things. That is what a fund is. But a fund of funds, what you do with the money of the investors is you invest in other funds Okay, you invest from the fund into other funds. So each of these is a fund like in week one. This is a fund like in week one. Okay, so it's a fund that invests in other funds. These things are very popular. There's many of them like that. Okay, so it may be surprising that you invest in a fund that invests in other funds. But these are very popular. They're very popular because of several reasons. Okay, um, one of the reasons is that these um, very often investors do not know these funds here. If you're an investor and you don't know these funds, someone has to tell you who they are. And many times uh, that knowledge has price, so you don't. People don't want to tell you. They'll give that information for free, so they will charge you for it. Um, other times is these funds they need lots of money to invest and investors don't have that much money so these are what they do is they bring together in assets investments together so that they can then invest in these funds because they are bigger. It's a way to collect a lot of money so you can access some of these funds. Okay. And also, um, investment, there's an aspect of investment in funds which we are not going to see in this course, unless maybe, maybe you're interested and then I can tell you, but this course is about quantitative investing. There's another part which is called qualitative. Maybe I'll spend one day on this investment, qualitative. Qualitative investment is things that you have to do which doesn't have, don't have to do with numbers, have to do with a process which is called due diligence and it's a process which is very lengthy 
and uh, it involves lawyers and uh, things like that. This can be very lengthy and can be very expensive. So when you invest in a fund of funds, the fund of funds takes care of all that work. So the qualitative investing is done by others. You don't have to do it yourself. So there are reasons why I think I will spend a little bit of time on this. I think I will explain this to you. So there are reasons why sometimes it makes sense to invest in a fund than invest in other funds. Okay. Now this fund of funds will have to have also an administrator, which is what counts the money. We'll have to have an auditor that does the fund audit. We'll have to have a bank where they, you keep the money, but there's not going to be any trading. The trading is not done by the fund of funds. The, 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 the trading will be done in each of the underlying funds in which it invests. Okay. And the interesting part about this is that there is a very simple fund of funds that we have already seen. Because the index, the HFRX index, is a fund of funds. Okay, so there is one particular case. The HFRX is actually a fund of funds. This is an index which is also a fund of funds. Sometimes, uh, in the, like in this case, the index is a fund of funds. In other cases, it's not. So before I tell you more about fund of funds, let me go back to this and make another distinction between this, which is that a stock index, a stock index is like a stock. It trades in the exchange and you can buy it. You can, you can buy the, um, you can buy the Hang Seng index as an ETF and it's just like a stock. It's just like a stock. But an alternative index is actually a fund of funds. There are many other types of fund of funds and we're going to see them next. But an index is a fund of funds. So this is interesting because a stock index is like a stock, but a hedge fund index is not like a hedge fund. It's a fund of funds and it has a very different structure. Okay. Um, the, the, um, when you invest in a stock index, the way to invest is through an ETF, which is a security. But an investment in a, in a, in a, in a, in a hedge fund index is not a security, it's a fund. So that's another difference. And it's not only a fund, it's a fund of funds. Okay, it's the simplest example of a fund of funds. So I can go back here and say that fund of funds, the first case is the index. The index is a fund of funds. Fund of funds is typically written like this, F-O-F. -F. Okay, now there are many more, many, many more, and we will see the methodologies that they use and all of that. But the first one that I want to mention to you is that from a legal perspective, a fund of funds, sorry, an index, a hedge fund index is a fund of funds. Okay. All right. So I think I'm going to just give you the definition and, uh, and then I'll, I'll stop for the day. And then next week, I'll tell you the properties that fund of funds have. We have seen uh, the uh, legal structure, which is here, and I'll tell you the definition. So a fund of fund is a fund whose assets, that's the money, assets is money, okay? are invested in other funds. So it's a fund that invests in other funds of anything. That's what a fund of funds is, okay? Now, why do you invest in other funds? There's different strategies, there are different styles. Just like when we saw trading styles, we had convertible arbitrage, equity, uh, distressed securities, global macro. Fund of funds also have strategies. And the strategy defines in which kind of funds do they invest. Okay, so sometimes, for example, they invest in, in diversified styles. A fund of funds will invest in different styles. Okay, they achieve investment diversification. They invest in, di in different styles. 
Um, other times they don't. Other times what they do is they invest in the same style, just in different managers. Okay, so here's same, same style, different managers or different management companies. Okay. For example, if I have my snow fund, uh, you could have a fund of snow funds. That means that they invest in my snow fund, but in another snow fund. My snow fund is in Canada, another snow fund is in Russia, another snow fund is in um, India, and then you invest in all of these different snow funds. Then you become a fund of snow funds. Hmm? Um, and finally, they can invest in a few or a lot. That's a few or a lot of individual funds. Sometimes you have a fund of funds which contains, for example, five funds. Sometimes you have funds that have 100 funds or more. Okay? These are very concentrated and these are very diversified. That could happen too. And these are part of the strategy that they use, okay? Just like when we saw um, long, short equities, long and short, you can have long A and short B and do very few of those pairs, or you can do many of those pairs. This is the same, but with funds instead of stocks, okay? They are pooled funds, and pooled funds means that, it's what I said earlier, because they typically have very low minimums. You can invest small amounts of money, because they use all of that money to, to have a very big um, amount of a very big asset base that you can use to invest in funds that have a very high minimum. Okay, for example, if I do my fund of, uh, if I do my snow fund that we did in the first week, maybe my minimum investment there is gonna be a very high number. Let's say I don't, it's a, it's a lot of work, so I don't wanna take any investment less than 20 million. If you only have a thousand dollars to invest, you cannot invest in my fund. But if you invest in a fund of funds that contains big amounts of money, your $1,000 will be part of an investment that comes into my snow fund. So this is a way that um, retail investors access big investments through fund of funds. Another is they have access to leverage. This we haven't seen yet. We're going to see this later in about a couple of weeks we will see access to leverage. Uh, and fund of funds is a very good way of having access to levels. We will see that later, okay? Then, um, they, there's also other, there's also another distinction uh, that makes these uh, fund of funds uh, different. Some of them, what they do is <clears throat> they like to have, they will have a, what's called a portfolio construction methodology, which we will see next week. Next week, we're going to see the portfolio construction methodologies. Some of them have that. And they do that to obtain a very good balance between risk and return. But others don't. Others, they are just marketing agencies for certain funds. So they have funds that they like, they want to sell them. They don't care about a portfolio construction methodology. They are not quantitative funds, they are qualitative funds, they just market the funds that they have on their portfolio, okay? Sometimes they even get paid by the underlying funds, okay? This is something which is, um, I'll show you, uh, that here, <coughs> typically in a fund, how does the management company get paid? We saw that at the beginning of the course, the company gets paid by the fund. The fund gives money to the management company, say one and 20, for example, right? In the case of fund of funds, sometimes the management company gets money from the fund of funds, one and 20, and then they get money also from the hedge funds. Sometimes that happens, okay? And I should say, typically this is bad. Typically, this is bad because when that happens, this we, we may see something about qualitative investing because when that happens, the management company is oftentimes they're not 
having the best investment in the fund of funds. What they have is the most profitable investment in the fund of funds. So if this manager, he gives a lot of money, they may get a bigger allocation. That's not good for the investors. It's good for the management company, but it's not good for the investors. So this has a name, it's called a fiduciary responsibility, which in this case may be broken, okay? So it's something which is um, not so good, okay? So this is not, not so good, but this tends to happen. Anyway, so these are the, these are the driving, um, these are the reasons that drive the creation of these fund of funds. Um, I'm gonna stop here now. Next week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the methodologies, the quantitative methodologies which are used to create a fund of funds. We have seen that there are others. Sometimes the methodology is whoever gives you the most money you put onto the portfolio. We're going to ignore that, hmm? but it happens in practice. Uh, instead, we will focus on the investment methodologies, the quantitative investment methodologies which are used to create fund of funds. In this week's assignment, I will ask you to start to work with the data you download. You already downloaded data from the HFR. Now I'll ask you to um, I'll give you some uh, data so you can work with stocks. Okay? Any questions? No questions? Then I'm going to end here. I have a, I have a meeting immediately after this uh, course, so <clears throat> I need to... Um, I cannot go over time. I need to stop. I need to stop now. Okay. Very good. So um, uh, I'll send you the assignment um, in the next few days, the next assignment, and I will see you next week. Okay. Bye now.